Chapter 19 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 19 The Lost City. From his hopeless perch, Biff heard Kamuka and Chuba shouting up above. Come on, you fellows, they yelled. Lend a hand. They were calling to Lee and Chandra, who were still coming up the granite steps. But it was useless. Biff and Mike represented too much dead weight, even for all four. Mike had Biff's wrist in a powerful grip. They were face to face as Biff looked up and said, You'll have to let go, Mike. They may be able to haul you back, but not both of us. It's both, gritted Mike, or neither. But you'll only be dragging the others along too. Can't you understand? No, Mike grinned grimly as he was jolted upward. Then, as he slipped back downward, he added, Yes. Mike realized that Lee had joined Chuba and Kamuka, that with Lee's helping hand they had managed a temporary lift, only to lose what little they had gained. But Mike still gripped Biff. Chandra will be helping them next, Mike said reassuringly. With four pulling, it will make a difference. Yes, I've managed to hold on a little longer, groaned Biff, but it can't change things, Mike. They still can haul you up if you'll only let go. Only I won't let go. A sharp sound was beating through Biff's brain. It came, crack, 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 in deadly monotone. He imagined he heard a new voice too, Chandra's voice saying, I'll be there, Biff. Then came the crack, crack, and again, I'll be there closer, it seemed, and just below. For the first time, Biff steeled his nerve and looked down. Chandra was there, on the curving brink itself, hanging to the ice where it was steeper than the spot where Biff himself was stretched. In his hand, Chandra held his axe, which he had retrieved after hurling it at the bear. With it, he was chopping into the ice, making those crack-crack sounds. Chandra hadn't gone up the steps to join the boys above. Instead, he had hacked steps of his own into the fringe of the icefall. He'd made enough to gain hand and toe holes for himself. Working up from those at an outward angle, he had literally chopped the slanted ladder, climbing it as he did. Now he was denting the ice beside Biff's right ankle, that done, he shoved Biff's right foot into place. Biff shifted his weight in that direction. Instantly the strain on Mike lessened just enough for him to open his half-closed eyes and stare downward in wonder. Crack, crack, crack. There was a toehold for Biff's left foot now. That really eased the strain, for Mike's body immediately moved up a bit, pulled by the boys above. Chandra kept hacking more steps higher, Biff kept climbing the new ones, leaving the old to Chandra, who promptly followed. Then, suddenly, Mike was up to safety, and they were hauling Biff up too, when he gasped, Wait, I'm bringing Chandra too. So Biff was, for by now Chandra was tiring. He clung to Biff's leg with one hand and kept chopping steps with the other, just enough to work himself up. Then hands from above gripped Chandra, and he and Biff were hauled up side by side. Kamuka found a board from an old catwalk and used it to bridge the gap across the missing stepping stone. One by one, the boys crossed the frozen stream above the mammoth ice hall. They found steps on the other side and descended for nearly half a mile before they overtook the party. Charles Keane, Bar Mashar, Herdu, and all the rest were waiting on a great wide lookout platform, viewing a stupendously breathtaking scene. There, set in a tremendous niche across the mile deep gorge, was the lost city of Chauncey. There were small stone huts in the foreground. These, if seen from straight above, would look like nothing more than rock heaps. But the pride of Chauncey, the palace of the Grand Lama, rose above a towering array of great stone steps and castellated walls, forming tier after tier of magnificent buildings to a height of nearly 500 feet, only to be dwarfed by the more tremendous mass of the cliff that overhung it. 
From the top of the great gorge it would be impossible even to glimpse this hidden wonder of the Himalayas in the massive hollow that had been hewn to contain it. Yet its relation to the gorge was such that sunlight streamed down into this secret setting during a good proportion of the day. Barma Shah summed it up when he stated, There is an old saying, as long as the Himalayas stand, so will Chauncey. Now I understand its meaning. If that cliff should tumble, the city would fall too. Amazed at the sight of the stupendous citadel, Biff did not tell his uncle Charlie and Barma Shah about his near plunge from the icefall. Instead, he reminded them of his mission. The sooner we get over there, the quicker we will find my father. Both men agreed, but Barma Shah added, You will have to see the Grand Lama first. That was the part that worried Biff most, though he didn't say so. Now that he was practically at his goal, he felt shakier than ever, for the Chomsey Lama now represented power on a vast scale, considering the size of his secret stronghold. The party continued down the granite trail, which zigzagged to the bottom of the canyon, and there crossed a deep but narrow stream on a bridge of simple logs. At the other side they came to a great wall, where the gates were being swung wide to receive them. They were ushered in by lesser lamas and other dignitaries, all wearing robes and costumes of an ancient day. With Herdu and the porters following, they were conducted up outer steps, then deep beneath a portico and up more steps until they reached a magnificently tiled inner courtyard where they were bowed to rows of benches. An elderly lama approached and gestured to Biff as he said, You may come. Next he addressed Charles Keane and Barma Shah. You too may follow. Then to the boys and you next. Pausing, he looked toward the porters and asked, any of these? Barma Shah decided to bring Herdu and three others, so in the order as arranged they entered another portico and climbed a short flight of gilded steps into a reception room also decorated in gold. There Biff was told that he was to enter the throne room of the Grand Lama alone, while Charles Keane and Barma Shah were to be ready when summoned. Golden doors were opening when Uncle Charlie whispered to Biff, Remember, you're meeting one of the wisest men in the East, as I can now believe. Pay close attention. To that, Biff nodded. Then, as trumpets blared, he was ushered through the doors, clutching the ruby that he had carried all along as his final passport to the Grand Lama's presence. Then Biff reached a throne where a figure in great golden robes and peaked hat awaited him. On each side stood a solemn dignitary, each in similar robes. One asked in a droning tone, You have brought the light of the Lama? Then as Biff solemnly replied, Yes, the other dignitary ordered, Give it to the Great One. No promises, no conditions, no mention of Biff's father. Just hand over the ruby and hope for the best. With a vow, Biff produced a magnificent red gem, which was glowing more vividly than ever. He placed it in the Chauncey Lama's outstretched left hand. Then, hoping to ask the obvious question, he looked up at the Great One. Biff gasped despite himself. Instead of viewing the austere visage of a man in his mid-fifties, he was looking into the smiling, friendly face of a boy no older than himself. Still weighing the ruby in his left hand, the Chauncey Lama extended his right in greeting as he said, Thank you, Biff. End of chapter 19 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 20 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 20. The Master Spy Before Biff could recover from his astonishment, the Chauncey Lama nodded to one of the men beside him. A moment later, a door opened in the side of the room, and Mr. Brewster entered, as brisk and smiling as when Biff had last seen him. A glad meeting followed. 
Then, with his arm around Biff's shoulder, Mr. Brewster approached the throne where the youthful Lama handed him the ruby, saying, I know you would like to see this, after all you have done to bring it here. Biff suddenly felt very much at home with this boy, who was so friendly toward his father. The ruby is sparkling now, said Biff, but it changes sometimes and turns dull. That worried Diwan Chand. Due probably to the setting, observed Mr. Brewster with a smile. If moisture gets beneath the gem, it detracts from the sparkle, but only temporarily. I am glad to hear that. The Chauncey Lama smiled as he took back the ruby. I notice that its glow has lessened, and I do not care for bad omens. As he placed the ruby in his robe, the Chauncey Lama turned to Biff again. Your father told me much about you, he said. That was one reason why I wanted you to bring the ruby, as it was a good way to meet you. But we weren't quite ready to tell the world that I am now the Chauncey Lama. At last we can declare it. He turned to one of the robed dignitaries. Usher in the others, he ordered. Then, as an afterthought, he added, Bring the boys in first. As Biff and his father stepped to one side, Mr. Brewster quietly explained that the former Chauncey Lama had died a few years after his visit to Leh, some twenty years before. He gave orders to keep his death a secret, explained Biff's father, until times became less troubled, so a boy who was born at the time the old Lama died was chosen to succeed him. He grew up on the throne, and there he is now. I was as much surprised as you when I met him. More surprises were due. As Biff's friends were ushered in, they looked as awed as Biff had been when he approached the throne. Awe turned to amazement when the boy Lama greeted them each by name and gave them the same winning smile that he had shown Biff. Bring in the others, the Chauncey Lama ordered, referring to Charles Keane and Barma Shah. He turned to Mr. Brewster. I shall now officially announce that your mission is complete, he said. The light of the Lama has been returned. Since it was restored by the present government of India, I shall ally myself with that nation for our mutual advantage. As for the trouble you encountered at the gold mines, it still has puzzling factors. The Chauncey Lama broke off to greet the newcomers who were being ushered in. To Charles Keane, he said cordially, I know you must be Biff's uncle. Then, turning to the other man, he added, And you are Barma Shah. Mr. Brewster was coming forward in quick interruption to confront the bland man with the broad face and the wide ears. Biff, accustomed to his father's calm, was surprised to hear Mr. Brewster exclaim excitedly, Wait, this man is not Barma Shah. He is an imposter. I have never seen him before. No, I am not Varma Shah, the impostor stated. But are you sure we haven't met? Don't you remember? He drew his hands over his ears, pursed his lips and narrowed his eyes to thin slits as he leered mockingly at Biff's father. His complete change of appearance was startling. The spy we nearly trapped down at the mine, Mr. Brewster exclaimed. You are Bella Cron, the man who was after the ruby. Yes, I am Bella Cron, the master spy answered, smiling, and I took the place of your friend Barma Shah after he was killed in a Calcutta riot of a month ago. Now I am taking over here. Cron, the pretended Barma Shah, was drawing a revolver from his pocket. He had raised his voice and it must have carried beyond the golden doors, for they suddenly burst open to admit Herdu, and the three men with him. No longer were the Changpas carrying bows and arrows. Herdu had a revolver, and the others were similarly armed. Efficiently, Cron motioned the robed dignitaries to one corner of the throne room, Thomas Brewster and Charles Keane to another, Biff and the boys to a third. That left the youthful Chauncey Lama still on his throne. For how long was a question, though he took the situation calmly. Pleased by the way he and his pit crew had taken over, Bella Cron decided to enlarge upon it. I started the trouble at the mines, he bragged. I wanted to acquire the Raja's ruby as a passport to bring me to this hidden citadel, so I could either make my own terms with the Chauncey Lama or else notify certain foreign factions 
just where they could find him. Brewster beat me here, but when I learned his son was bringing the ruby, I decided to come along with him. With a mocking look toward Biff, Kron swept his hand around his head, turban fashion, then downward from his chin to indicate a beard. Remember that Sikh in the bus, he demanded, the one with the false beard? I was that Sikh. That's how I picked up your trail. I saw Chandra buy the tickets, and I purposely crossed your path later. For other reasons, I had helped stir the Kali cult into making trouble, but I didn't know they were hot after you. So from then on, I looked out for you, knowing that as Barma Shah, your father's friend and contact, you would bring me here. I saved your life during the tiger hunt, and again, when the bear was after you, I tried to get rid of your uncle on the bridge because I didn't want him in the way. So I had Herdu cut the cable. Kron glanced at Herdu, who shrugged apologetically. Herdu was slow that time, declared Kron, but he did a good job faking yeti tracks to scare Tix and his crew clear back to Lay, so we could hire the Changpas who were waiting in the valley where the trails met. It seemed that Bella Kron, the master spy, had called every possible turn, but he had a still bigger trick to play. My men are stationed in the courtyard below, he declared. I shall have Herdu send two of his men down and bring the rest up. He waved towards the door, and Herdu promptly started the two men on their way. Then we shall leave, taking you with us. Kron approached the Chonsi Lama as he spoke. It will take all the wealth of this hidden city to make the first payment on your ransom. Calmly, the youthful Lama studied Kron, then smiled as though ready to accept whatever fate decreed. Kron responded with a glare, then swung to view the others in the same ugly fashion. I will soon decide what to do with the rest of you, Kron began. In fact, he paused as a heavy rap sounded on the golden door. I'll decide right now, because Herdu's men are back. Let them in, Herdu. Herdu turned and opened the door. As he did, he came flying back as though a tornado had hit him. Herdu's gun scaled from his hand as he landed hard and flat. The one man still with Herdu was jumping in to help him, only to be sprawled in the same efficient fashion. Now Biff saw the man with the double-barreled fist who had played the part of a human whirlwind. Biff raised a shout that the other boys echoed. Muscles! End of chapter 20 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 21 of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 21. Secret of the Snows. Bella Tron, though standing ready with his gun, was caught flat-footed by the speed and power that muscles showed. Tron was a crack shot, but he had to wait until Herdu and the other husky guard were out of the way before he could open fire. In his eagerness to concentrate on muscles, Kron forgot two others. Those two were Thomas Brewster and Charles Keane. Knowing exactly how far muscles would carry his drive, Biff's father and uncle acted accordingly. At the crucial moment, they launched a double drive of their own. Kron, coming to deliberate aim as muscles hulked up as a target, was suddenly overwhelmed before he could pull the trigger of his gun. Excitedly, Biff and the other boys were pointing to the outer room where more figures were appearing, but Muscles motioned for them to be calm. Then, through the doorway, came Tix and half a dozen of his Ladakhi crew. Amiably, Muscles waved them out, saying, Never mind, boys, you won't be needed. The men from Leh realized suddenly that they were in the presence of the Chonsi Lama, and that in itself accomplished results. Bowing low, they backed out through the golden doors. Gravely, the Chauncey Lama returned their bows until they were gone. Then he turned to Biff and said, If you introduce your friend Muscles, I will grant him an audience. Then he can tell his story of how he turned the tables. Biff introduced Muscles, who responded characteristically. Everything's under control, he said, so I can take time out to talk. 
It seems like talking is getting to be the best thing I do. Those Sherpas we landed among thought I was what they called a yeti, but I talked them out of it. Then they were so glad they were ready to do anything I wanted, so I talked them into coming over this way and catching up with the party that was on its way here, just on the chance I might be needed. We tried to take a short cut, and whom did we run into? Muscles turned to Biff. Your whole crew of porters heading back to Lay. When they told me they'd been seeing Yeti tracks, I figured somebody had been faking them. Somebody was returned, Biff. Herdu. The Chauncey Lama was becoming more and more intrigued. He expressed the eagerness felt by all the boys when he suddenly urged, Go on, Muscles. Tell us more. Well, your honour, Muscles resumed, suddenly impressed by the youthful Lama's robe. I did some more talking to Tix and his friends. I told them that there weren't any such thing as Yetis, and that having been mistaken for one, I was somebody who should know. So they turned right round and came along with me. Then, to convince them further, I rigged myself up in an old yak hide and wrapped old towels around my shoes so I could scare Hoodoo and his tribe into thinking they were really looking at a yeti and not just footprints. So you were the thing we saw go bounding up the ledge, exclaimed Biff. That's right, said Muscles. I kept on going, to clear up beyond a big rock pile. Chandra turned to Biff. You see, I was right. It was dark when I started out, continued Muscles, so I brought a rifle with me. I'd left it behind the rock pile, and when I saw you tangling with that big bear, I up and clipped him, first shot. There was other shooting coming from down your way, so I had my chance to clear out, and did. And you followed us from then on, queried Biff. Sure did, returned Muscles. We saw you go into the woods and disappear, so we did the same and found the steps that brought us down here. They let us in when I said I was with you, Biff, so I guess you're pretty important around here. Biff is important here, declared the Chauncey Lama. Very important. I decided to take over, Muscles went on, when we found a lot of Herdu's men going down in the courtyard. We jumped them before they knew what to expect. They knew, though, when they got it. I came on up and ran into a couple of Herdu's men coming down, so I bagged them and turned them over to my crew. Then I walked in here, and you saw the rest. It was time now for the Chauncey Lama to hold a conference with his advisers, so he politely bowed his visitors and rescuers out. On the way down from the throne room, Biff said to Muscles, So you don't believe there are such things as yetis? I didn't when I came here, returned Muscles. But after one look at this place, I'm ready to believe anything. They left Belacron, Herdu, and a few of his men in the custody of the palace guards, a dozen men in garish red and yellow uniforms, whose chief business was blowing trumpets, opening doors, and participating in ceremonies generally. The guards were armed with brass muskets that looked like models of ancient Chinese cannon and probably hadn't been fired since the day gunpowder was invented. The guards were good custodians, however, for the massive buildings forming the foundations of the slant-walled palace were honeycombed with secret passages and hidden cells. Escape was impossible even for Bella Cron, the master spy, and his principal followers. As for the rest, they were simply Changpa tribesmen who had been coaxed in from remote Tibet by Herdu, just as Muscles had brought in the visiting Sherpas from the falls. By now, Sherpas and Shangpas were becoming friends, rather than one group having the other in its charge. The Ladakhi, too, were fraternising with both groups and were all so overwhelmed by the importance of the Chauncey Lama that they were ready to follow his commands. So they were given the freedom of the fabulous city until the time should come for them to return to their native climes. Mr. Brewster sat in on the conferences held by the Chauncey Lama and his advisers, with Charles Keane an occasional participant in the deliberations. During breaks in the session, they chatted with Biff and the other boys, who were lodged in special guest quarters with muscles. When the previous Lama died, Mr. Brewster stated, he saw to it that his successor would be educated in modern ways as well as those of ancient days. Your friend, the young Lama, had an English tutor and is versed in other modern languages as well. 
He is now just sixteen years old and has two more years to go until he is of age. The two men you saw with him were the acting regent and the prime minister, who have been keeping Chauncey as it was until the new Grand Lama takes full power. But now that the Raja's ruby has been returned to become again the light of the Lama, they have decided that this is their day of decision. All agree that Chauncey no longer should be the lost city. That became official the next day. The natives of Chauncey were told that they were free to visit the outer world without restriction. The Chauncey Lama entrusted Mr. Brewster with the state dispatches to be taken to New Delhi, so that the boundaries of tiny Chauncey could be defined and its status determined through international negotiations. Belacron, Herdu and a few others were to be turned over to the government of India, as they were wanted for crimes committed within the jurisdiction of that nation. Biff and the boys had a last pleasant visit from the Chauncey Lama and then were on their way. All Chauncey was out to wave farewell to the departing visitors. From the distance came booming sounds like a parting salute, but not from guns. Those were the reverberations from the crashing masses of rock and ice that so frequently toppled from the granite walls that flanked this narrow land, the place of living thunder. All the porters and native tribesmen made the return climb from the mile-deep chasm and back through the mountain passes beyond. There were no serious incidents along the way, as the expedition no longer was troubled with plotters such as Belacron and Herdu. Instead of returning to Ley with the Ladaki, Biff and his father and the rest of the party continued south to the ranges where the Sherpas lived. There, Charles Keene and Muscles put the plane in flying order, and after a few pleasant days in the fertile valley, the first group took off for New Delhi. Charles Keene was at the controls. With him were Mr. Brewster, Biff, Chandra and Kamuka, all of whom would give first-hand evidence concerning the double dealings of the notorious Bella Cron. Charles Keene was then to fly back to the Sherpa Valley and pick up Muscles, Lee, Chuba and Mike Arista to bring them on to New Delhi where all the boys would meet again. But as the plane climbed high above the mountain pass, thoughts of a more immediate reunion flashed through Biff's mind and brought an anticipatory smile to his lips. By the time they reached New Delhi, Biff's mother would be there from Darjeeling with the twins. Eyes half closed, Biff could already picture the eager faces of Ted and Monica as his brother and sister waited breathlessly to hear the full story of his latest adventures. End of chapter 21 Recording by Peter Tomlinson End of Mystery of the Ambush in India by Andy Adams